friends. Glad to see you made it. We're gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He's alive. Today we're going to be going over chapters 5, 6, and hopefully a little bit of chapter 7 of the book of Hosea. And, uh, you know, the last thing we can say, this is a story that, that, that's happening thousands of years ago. Or, or we can bring this to life in, in our world, and it's very easy in our world today, as he's talking uh, of a future time to come. You know, and what was to come was the glory of God, who is about to, to, to release them from the bondage, and the bondage of sin, the bondage of living in sin, the, you know, the results of it. So that's what we see here, you know, uh, a lot of times we think God's going to rain down judgment and that, and you know, our deeds, uh, we're judged by our own words, we're judged by our own measure, we're, we're judged by our own deeds. You know, that's the thing, if we can judge ourselves as God sees us as being righteous and holy to Him, to the salvation of Jesus, then... We should be able to see and judge each and every one according to that same standard, the, the standard of grace and, and mercy. So, we see there in chapters 4 of the book of Hosea, you know, a, a great harlotry has happened, a great shame has happened. Although they claim to know God, same here in America, that's the thing, today's message is, Mostly for, for Americans, but, but I pray and hope that anyone across the world may watch this so that uh, you could take it and use this in, in your own communities, in your own places, in your own life. And, and so, God, the word God is, uh, who is God? You know, we got in the United States of America, in God we trust. But, but who is God? You know, God couldn't be anything. But Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. Today, yesterday, and forevermore. And so if anything comes and it's new, well, that's not from God because God is, is there's nothing new. He's been telling us the same thing over and over for 6,000 years. And are we willing to trust Him? Are we willing to trust Him? Because when we lose trust in God and, and we go out, or Jesus Christ, and we go out for a foreign God, that's where all the pains and sufferings come. And, and the results of it is suffering across the entire land. The entire land. Everybody, both good, the righteous, the, the unholy, the, the holy, and the suffering the effects of, of leaving God, leaving the teachings and instructions of Jesus Christ, creates all sorts of suffering. And so that's the thing. At what point do we turn back to the teachings and instructions of God? And not just turn back to, to read them and observe them, but, but to put them into action, put them into a reality in our world. So let us begin with the prayer as we go through the teachings here of the book of Hosea. Heavenly Father, our Father who lives in the heavenly realms, God of the heavens and the earth, gracious God, it is you who own all things, both seen and unseen. Nothing has existence without your being. For we know it is your spirit, Heavenly Father, that is upon all flesh. How we love you, the adore you. How thankful we are, Father, to, to have a, a, the time and the opportunity to, to know who you are, to have the knowledge and the wisdom. How gracious are you. Again, as always, Father, we ask for you to come and dwell with us today. Give us wisdom and understanding so, so that we may better know you. We may have peace with ourselves and with you, Father. Forgive us. 
Forgive us for all our wrongdoings, as we know you have, as we have forgiven all those who have wronged on us. Gracious God, rain your mercy, your, your daily bread, your love, your gentleness, and your kindness. Restore us, Father. Heal us. So that those paths of temptations and, and, and trials that may be guarded by your love and, and your mercy. Deliver us from that. Deliver us from the bondage and the sufferings of, of sin. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. So we're talking here a little bit about the apostasy and the teachings. And that's the thing, you know, you come to today's world, and especially in America, as a lot of teachers and preachers want to create a, an empire of rich people. And through that creation of the empire of rich people, we, we, we begin to play favoritism, begin to create a, a, an image, you know, and, and this is the golden image of, of which we all must live. And if you ain't receiving these blessings, well then, you need to get right with God. Well, well that's the thing, is God rains down blessings, not for us to hoard or, or hide or, or that for us but 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 so that th these blessings may be enjoyed by by each and every one of us and so that's the thing in this day in this time there, there was a great political uprising and we see this today in our world a lot of unrest we're all upset with the rulers of the world Especially in America, we're all upset with our bosses. We're all upset over greed and the results from greed. Right? We get upset. Let us hear what the Lord has to say about this. And that's the thing. It's not about God raining judgment and wrath. This is the results of living in sin. We will begin to devour one another because all men have an evilness in them. And the only thing to, to keep us hold or, or check on our evilness is the grace of Jesus Christ who prevents us from being evil. Now, that's the thing. Let us begin to see what happens. Chapter 5, verse 1. Hear this, O priests, and pay attention. O house of Israel, O house of the king, give ear. If you are all called to judgment, it is you who are all called to judgment. For you have become a snare at Mitzvah, a net spread upon the table. In their perversity, they have sunk into wickedness, and I am rejected by them all. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. Now Ephraim has played the harlot. Israel is defiled. Their deeds do not allow them to return to their God. For the spirit of harlotry is in them and they do not recognize the, the Lord. Right? That's the thing. We, we, we can all claim to know God, but, but God is love. And we come in and we'll go to see that, that not only is God love, God is, is mercy, and, and He desires from us love and, and mercy. You know, many of these preachers and teachers today have built empires of, of millions of dollars, some billionaires, some hundred millionaires. Millions and millions of dollars and can see the, the worth of buying toy, uh, uh, things like jet airplanes and, and giant buildings and big parking lots and, and a place to bring people to gather together, all in, in the hopes to just worship God. That's the thing, you know, we, we go to church and, and that's what we all want to do, right? Especially today, just worship God. Yet... Uh, there's a coldness 
to the, to to a church, you know, or you go to Sunday morning service, and it's just the the sure we we worship God, but between one another, and I understand we're strangers, and I understand some people have little faith and great amounts of faith in all different levels, but but there is a certain amount of coldness in there. Because a, a lot of it comes down, I want to go worship God so that I may receive that which is rightfully mine. You know, I want the reward. I, I want the, you know, better job. I want the bigger home. I, I want the new car. I want to go on the magic vacation. So I'll come and, and bring my gifts to God and lay them down at the altar in the hopes to gain power to my prayer so that I may receive that which is rightfully mine, right? And that's the thing. Outside of God, there, there is no desire for love. There's no desire for mercy. And there's no desire to, to care for one another, your, your neighbors, your brothers and sisters. Because the desire to be fulfilled from, from these things, and that's exactly what preachers and teachers want to do, is feed off that desire to sin. Right? You know, I understand Jesus Christ covers all sin, and with us, nothing is sinful. But not all things are good for us, and not only is it not good for us, not all things are Good for the community, good for others. Right? We know the difference between good and evil, especially in these days, just by through morals of law. So, it says the arrogance of Israel bears witness against him. Ephraim stumbles in his guilt, and Judah stumbles with them. With their flocks and their herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them, and they have been untrue to the Lord, for they have begotten Ill illegitimate children. Now shall the new moon devour them together with their fields. That's the thing. You know, it's kind of amazing here in our day and age. You know, God restores the, the nation of Israel. And not not to, to, to show that, that, that the Jews are any more special than anybody else, but, but only that, that God's word is, is trustworthy. When God makes a promise, it, it comes true. No matter how long it takes in this world for it to come to pass. God is patient, and yet his word always comes true. You see that today. And first thing they do is a nation is begin to rebuild a, a temple. Right? They always want to build temples. And God says, I shall not dwell in a temple. There with Jesus Christ in, in the book of Matthew. This the temple curtain was ripped open. Go through the Bible, and any time that the garments were ripped open or torn off, like Samuel, uh, Saul grabs Samuel's garment and it tears us apart. And, oh, now the kingdom has been torn from you. Uh, any time a tragedy of a young child has died, they, they rip their clothes open. And that's what the ripping of the temple uh, curtain was there in, in uh, the holy temple is it was significant for God saying, My son has died and has ripped open the curtain and has removed himself from that spot. No longer a, a place of holiness, but a, but a place of, of death. God wishes to dwell in the tabernacle, as he told David. I don't want you to build a, a temple, for it is in the tabernacle I wish to dwell in. We being the living tabernacles of the Lord our God. You see it today. It says, that's the thing. 
Why is there so much war, unrest, and, and, and lack of peace in, in that area of the world? Because they're, they're missing Jesus Christ. And unless they say, unless you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the living God, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the thing, you know. And yeah, he was. And then he died. And now look, he is alive. In the same way with us. We were once dead. But now we're alive because Jesus Christ now lives in us. Let's move on to, it says, Blow the horn in Gilgad, the trumpet in Ramon. Sound the alarm in Beth Haven. Look behind you, old Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a waste. On the day of chastisement against the tribes of Israel, I announce what is sure to be. The princes of Judah have come like those who move a boundary line. Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. That's the thing. What is it that, that's going to save us for, from this judgment? And it's not judgment. Our witness, our deeds are, are proving our, uh, the witness. God's word is, you can even go back to the book of Revelations, as God says. Who else announces to us what is to come other than God? And it clearly explains. Death. <laughs> Death is to come. And that's the thing. We will be chastised worked over, worked around, as God says, I'm going to put hedges and thorns all around you guys to, to keep you. As God is a jealous God, a jealous Father, a loving Father. He is, if we get going off too far off the path, God is going to come down and stop us from, from fulfilling a, 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 an evil desire, especially if the grace of God wants to save us. And that's what he's doing here today in this world, showing the world that his, his spirit is being poured out on all the flesh of the world. For he said, all the flesh of the world shall do these things. And they're not going to do it through the works of men, but, but through the will of the living God living in men. That's how I know. That's how I know. We are all brothers and sisters. And if we could love Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, the human race, if we could love the human race as though it was God's one and only Son, if we could love each other as though we loved ourselves, if we loved ourselves, our one being, as though it was God's one and only Son, and then we loved each other as though they were God's one and only son. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And you have passed from life, from death to, to, to life. That's the thing. In our afflictions, in, in our pains, in our sufferings, in allowing greed to, to, to rule over our lives for, for a time, for a season, when we come to see there must be a better way. Must be a better way. Chapter 6, verse 1. Let us return to the Lord, for it is He who has rent, but He will heal us. He has struck us, but He will Bound our, bind our woes. He will revive us after two days. On the third day, he will rise us up to live in his presence. You know, same there as Jesus was telling them, you know, that the, the Messiah must suffer a great amount of pain. And that Peter rises up, you know, and all the disciples. We will not abandon you. In fact, we will die with you. 
No, indeed, you, you, you will abandon me. Because that's what the scriptures say. But do not fear, I will return to you. You know, Peter goes and denies Jesus three times. And then went through a, a period of great weeping and bitter, bitter weeping, as though like, like, the, 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 like drinking wormwood. Bitter, deep to the, to the core, deep to the, the sinew of your bones. Bitter weeping. For he had denied God right to his face. But yet on the, on the third day, I mean, how, how more dead could you be spiritually? I mean, you know, have you ever lived in, in a place of total depression? How much more dead could you be spiritually? And then on the third day, when, when, when the girls came and saw that he had been gone, and the tomb had been cracked open. And they saw angels of the Lord. Mary sees Jesus. And they go back to tell the disciples, Peter and John. John, being a much faster runner, gets there first, but he was so afraid I couldn't even, he couldn't even go in. Peter, could, could you imagine? And the third day, the jubilance, the excitement. Even though they were unfaithful, even though they doubted, even though they did not him. He still appeared to them. He still had grace and, and mercy to them. And not just to them, but even to Thomas. Doubting Thomas, stick your hand in my side. Do you feel that I have substance? I am a being. An uncorruptible being. And this life lives in you. Also reminds me of we have gone now through two days and two nights. Third day is about to begin. Go ahead and look into the YouTube world and look. Just, just, just Google Dead Men Rising. And you'll see hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, dead men coming back to life with, with amazing stories. On the third day. Now, if God sees one day is a thousand years, we're now at the three thousand, going to begin. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died and rose. And now we're going to begin a, a, third, a third year, a, a third day, a, a third millennium, a, a another thousand years. And then in this thousand years, God, Jesus Christ, will be in our presence. There in the day of Pentecost when God rained his spirit, the Holy Spirit, there upon the disciples and from the disciples begins to move across the world. And here we are today. Here we are today. Come full circle back. As the Jews went through the circle, the cycle of what it was to become holy to God, we, the Gentiles and the world, are now running full circle to what it knows, what it is to know God. And that's the thing. How many places, and you know, I've been coming up with this idea, and it's not an idea, it's not new, about creating the, the, this farm, and that's the thing, me and my family, we're gonna sell our home, you know, and buy this farm, and get four or five, you know, uh, buildings there, maybe six at the most, I don't know, or so, but you keep it kind of small, you don't let these groups get too big, and you say, and we'll buy it and pay cash for that, and then you say, well, where is all this coming from? The Bible from God's word. Abraham goes out and buys Israel. 
He didn't just go in and steal it. He didn't just go in and take it. He didn't just go in. He went in and he'd buy a piece of land and they'd buy some here and buy this. And, and same with Jacob. And they'd go down through the story. And God, by purchasing. And that's the thing. Jesus Christ owns the world. Jesus owns the world. And we are owned by him as well. What do we want to do with our time here? Be a good stewards. Not only with the world, but with ourselves and our neighbors. What would that look like? You know, that's the thing. What if, as Christians, instead of taking that $65 million, you know, and buying one jet that, that it can only please me and my work, or take that money and how many you, you buy and purchase? The land, and then no longer does it owned by somebody outside of God's kingdom. Now, God's kingdom, God's kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ now owns that land. And it's not just a place to come and worship, but see, if you create and put five buildings that are livable in and make it a working church, and everybody on the staff, whether it be the, the computer warriors, <coughs> the cooks, the, 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 the <coughs> prayer warriors, the preachers, the teachers, the children, whoever it is, you, you, your reward, your pay is. You get to live in a home. And you never have to worry about losing that home. You know, recreating the first century church. You know, they'd bring all their money and their gifts to the apostles, and then what would the apostles do with it? Would the apostles take that money and then go and buy a brand new chariot, and then, oh, Peter, he was riding all across Rome in his golden chariot. No, they, they redistributed it back to the people as they had need, to the brothers and the sisters. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have a tithe. Why? Because you, you don't tithe, right? You don't tax. If you were the king and, you, and here's your son, would you tax your son? No, you tax those who are outside the kingdom. Hmm. Instead of asking for a tithe, do you create something like, you know, as you're there and you're a bunch of ladies, you, you can create a, a soap. You know, make like, you know, a, a organic soap, a organic candles, a, a, a sheer uh, the uh, uh, alpacas. I love alpacas. Make, make clothing. Make, you know what I mean? And then sell that. At the market, that thing is not really a, a working, uh, or, uh, like a church, but it's a working, living church. And we, we would accept, you know, and you get people to come in and experience what it would be like to, to live with you for a week or a weekend or whatever. And as they experience what that's like, they, they take that knowledge and that experience and they go home and, and maybe... They would see recreating another place like that all around where everybody there had the opportunity for food. And you keep these groups kind of small because you don't want to get too big. Five or six families, right? And they're all gathered together through the spirit of the living God. Families working together. 24-hour church, open, 24 hours. You know, we all sleep at different times and that, and you organize it. That way it's open. One of a, a great place for uh, uh, battered women, right? I'm beat down, abused, raped, and left for dead almost by my husband, and he's, he's drunk and, and abusive, but I don't have no family left. Mom, my brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandma and mom, dad, died, dead, gone, last one on earth. Yet my husband abuses me every night. 
a place to go, you know, that's the thing with God, and I've worked a little bit, small, I mean, small bit, but it was to show me, you know, there was a, uh, one of the churches uh, I was involved with, they would have that work where they'd have, you know, seven different, sometimes ten uh, women who, who left everything. And I mean, they, they had home, they had everything. They grabbed their kids and the clothes on their back and laughed. But they had nowhere to go. They wanted to leave a, a very abusive situation. So the church opened itself up for these women to come in. And then the church members, you know, and that's what I was a part of, would go and make dinner for these 10, 15 people. Moms and their children. But you'd have a, a place for them to come so that they may be healed and restored. A, a place to bring people out of a, a city, a, a life a, of death, into a, a place where they could be restored, where, where they wouldn't be judged. And it wouldn't matter. You know, it would be more like a, a, a resort, uh, not a resort. Uh, I don't know what you'd call it. Like a resort, a church, a working church, a working farm, all working towards the goals and the will of God to, to free the captives of this world, to bind up the broken. You know, imagine what we, if we had $65 million instead of buying a jet. We made and created these little communities all around, and then all of a sudden, you know, instead of taxing ourselves, it does take money to do to, to first investment, to purchase the land, to buy the, so that this world, this government, this place, no longer has dominion over us. And eventually, by, by you know, creating self as being self-sustained. Self-sustained. From electricity, everything. Heat, whatever. Eliminate money. And you eliminate the power of these foreign gods. The power of greed. You eliminate the power of all that stuff that the devil is trying to use against us, trying to use to divide us. You know? That, that's one preacher who, who desires. A $65 million jet. What about the other 15 or 20 millionaire preachers? How much impact could you have on, on this world in America? Whom you all claim to know God. But whose God do you know? Jesus says, I desire mercy. But by charging money to, to, to unbelievers and finding a, a way to sell your talents, and it's not selling. Once you come to the farm and, and, and I want to be a part of it, then you're a part of it. You're a part of it, whoever you may be. But to bring people in who aren't sure, you charge a little money, you know, sell your soap a little bit at the farmer's market, your fruits, your vegetables, your eggs, or whatever it is. Just a little bit to, to, to keep you going. Certain items. There's money. You know, we need bathroom items. And, and, and you need a little gas. But you can eliminate. You know, the mortgage owned the land like Abraham. You go in and you just start buying it. And as we buy it, now it belongs to God's kingdom forever and ever. When you get too old and you're about to get the bucket, you know, that's the thing. That's the goal of bringing others to, to replace you. <laughs> it's not to replace you, but to glorify God for your faithfulness, to, to, to care for one another, to, to put God's will in the care for each other above the will to, to be greedy, the will to, to, to divide, the will to devour. You know, that's the thing. Take away their power. 
restore the, the power of God's living word by, by living it out. You know, that's the thing too. Ah, love is an action and we must prove to one another we love each other. You know, that's the thing. Could you only imagine the world we'd be living in today? If you took, you know, if there's 28 percent of America is Christians. Could you imagine 28 percent of the United States of America living without the fear of ever being homeless? Not only for me, but my children and my grandchildren. And not only the fear of not being homeless, but the fear of not going hungry for my children and my grandchildren. And you say, well, if you did that, what would happen? The spirit of the living God would move into you so deep. You know, Peter. Peter. People wanted just to do for Peter's shadow to cross over them. Because they knew they would be healed. Because the spirit of the living God, well, he was so full of the Holy Spirit. And it came to his obedience to the love of God's word. Jesus Christ said, Hey, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Are you, are you sure you love Jesus Christ? I mean, think about it. Do you really love Jesus Christ? Then take care of my lambs. I mean, just think about it. Do you really love Jesus Christ with all your heart? Then, then, then take care of these sheep. And if you care for them, what's going to hold you back? The spirit of the living God? As he says there in... Hosea, when God's hand comes to and grabs onto you, who in what force is ever going to peel you out of the hand of the living God? What could do that? Think about that. If Jesus Christ in the hand and the right arm of the living almighty God and creator of the universe the earth and everything we know or can even imagine had you in the palm of his hand. Who is going to take you out of that? Right. Let us see love for one another as being the, the golden rule. And real love for one another is when we put that love to action for one another. And then we grab out of this dying dead world and place into the living kingdom of the living God as he takes his taking over dominion over the entire earth shall be an eternal dominion. For love is eternal. Every day you hate and anger and just dying. Lust and greed is dying each and every day, but each and every day, God's love can be seen, can be found through the living vessels of his children. Let us love each other. Let us love each other. This, let us prove to this earth, to this world, and to this country It is the grace of Jesus Christ that shall live forever. While this world is eating and devouring and hurting one another, let us love each other. Let us take over dominion. But by purchasing this world, bringing it into the kingdom, you know, that's the thing with uh, Paul and them. You know, Paul says, you know, do we want to create a burden for each other? 
Do we want to always be a burden upon one another? Uh, no, we, we don't want our brothers and sisters to be burdened by each other. But we want to be a part of, of a loving family. We'll let the, the, the sin of this world be the burden on, on them. You know, and that's the thing. Shouldn't we go to them, the sinners of this world, and, and charge them money so that, so that they too can be a part of the glory of God? as we grab their money and bring it into the kingdom so that they too may be a part of the glory of God instead of taxing each other and our brothers and sisters and I'm not saying we go and sell Jesus no you, you create a, a place of peace, serenity happiness, oneness with God and as you bring others in to experience that, they will see, they will see that where they've been spending their money, their time, their effort has been wasted. Have they been spending their money, their time, and their effort into the restoration of the kingdom of the living God? They would have seen. It was worth everything to lose everything. <laughs> hey, says to the rich man, go sell all your stuff and give it to the poor. And then follow me. And the kingdom of heaven will be yours. What if we did that? What if we did that? <laughs> Right? What if we did that? I don't know. I don't know. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would uh, bless this video and anyone who watches it. Bless them with the grace and the mercy of, of, your, of your love, your joy, and your happiness. Father, unveil the, the wisdom and knowledge from what you are seeking. We just say we, we lack for, we die for a lack of knowledge. We die for the want of knowledge. But rarely do we die for love. Father, give us the, the will to joyfully and willing lay down the, the, the lusts and the desires of this world which are dying each and every day to, to, to engrave, to be engulfed. But the spirit of, of you, the spirit of the living Christ, the spirit of revelation, a, a spirit of mercy, grace, spirit of confidence, a spirit to comfort us. Reign, Father, your mercies. Not just on us, but the whole world. Give us the power to understand you, Father, reign on both the just and the unjust. Gracious God, lead us. Not down paths of temptation, but gracious God, lead us to a place to the deliverance. Deliver us, Father, from the hand of the evil one. Deliver us. Jesus Christ, they ask that you would Bring peace to our heart. And only the peace which you can bring. Father, we ask for peace, serenity. Allow us to be humble children. Give us the ability to love one another, just as you have loved us. Thank you, Father. I thank you, Jesus. With all my heart, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you. I thank you, Father. I thank you for the knowledge. I thank you for the wisdom. I thank you for, the, for all you have done. For I am nothing but a willing vessel for your spirit and your will. And I thank you for using me each and every day. I thank you for the food I eat. I thank you for the birds that sing. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for everything. Holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I don't know if we.
we got covered much on all, all this stuff, but I think it is. That's the thing. Uh, uh, there's a time for everything. A time for harvest and, and a time to die, a time to be happy, and a time to work. And all of it is vain. <laughs> because, you know, that's the thing. Wouldn't it be nice? Look at the birds in the air. I mean, look at the birds. They don't reap and they don't sow. How awesome would it be to, to live a life of no reaping or sowing? But a life that was just meant to be lived. Top fear. Birds don't are afraid to, to not have a nest. A bird is not afraid to, to, to have a lack of food. Bird does not worry about how his, his young will be reared up. But it is God Almighty who provides all those things. Isn't it us men who are grabbing those things and saying to ourselves, I know, I will store up all this stuff in my barn because I have so much. And yet it's on that day when the barns are full and everything's going, then bam, here comes God to take away all that. And then who oh, will get all the stuff that you've been storing up throughout this life? Let us take possession of this, this dying world and bring it into the kingdom of the living God. You know, just imagine how many people spend, I've seen it, people have spent a billion dollars, some uh, uh, 20 million dollars, some 5 million dollars on a building. You know, you got 3 million dollars just in, in the parking lot alone. I know, I used to build parking lots. Three million dollars in the parking lot alone. The curb, the gutter, the sidewalks, the flowers, and the trees. They haven't got inside to the pews yet. Another five, ten million dollars just to build the building. But what if we use that money? Instead of creating a, a big, giant worship temple center, we took that and we quit robbing God and we used that to have mercy and care for one another so that eventually at the end of this next thousand year period homelessness and the worry of it will be gone. There will be a place where broken down, battered women may go without fear. There'd be a place for broken children having this society with no purpose for life would have a place to come and put their hands into a purpose. A place where you could have a lined up the warriors of the living God all working together as a swarm of bees go through and pollinate the flowers. A place where the blind may be released from their bondage so they may see a place where the crippled may walk, a place where the spirit of the living God lives each and every day. See you next time.